Hello and welcome to the February Yancey Street Special Edition podcast, also known as Patsy Walker and an Exploration of Toxic Romance in Comics. On this special edition podcast episode, we are going to be discussing some very serious topics um, and some really controversial topics. And so before we do anything, I would like to start off um, with a content warning. There is going to be a lot of dark things discussed on this podcast because for whatever reason, these things keep happening in the comics. So that being said, we are putting out right now for this entire episode a trigger warning covering broadly incest, rape, domestic abuse, emotional and physical abuse, mental torture and abuse, suicide, slut-shaming, infidelity, etc. Um, I'm sure I could go on, but you get the picture here. And if you are familiar with any of these stories, you know what's coming. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about Patsy Walker because she is the inspiration for me having done this episode. But the bulk of the episode is going to be that exploration of toxic romance in comics. So we're going to be going through a number of comic couples who have historically toxic relationships. And as a little asterisk to that, I did just stick to big two comics, the traditional big two, Marvel and DC I can't even imagine how much work I would have been had to put into this if I included any other indie stuff, because that is so much. But so that being said, this is just going to stick to superhero comics, Cape Comics exclusively, uh, because that is honestly me not wanting to have to dive into the huge world of real, real dark indie stuff. (laughs) Maybe someday we'll talk about what's out there. But for today, we're going to stick with the superhero landscape. And you may be thinking, somehow you're surprised that there is such a history of toxic romance in comics. Well, um, to give you a brief heads up here, I'll just go through the list of couples that I have uh, a little bit of explanation. Some of these are a little shorter blurbs and some of these are longer. For a couple of them, I have brought in a lot more context um, from writers and from readers at the time of when these stories were originally published um, and what the writers have were said at the time and what the writers versus what they say now, because there's a lot of... You, you can't really... Um, it's, it's hard to judge when you weren't there, right? Um, or it's easy to judge when you weren't there. Um, so I try to pull a lot of context into some of these stories. Um, so that some of them, I have quotes from other articles that I've found and read quotes from the creators. Um, but in any case, this is uh, the list of the couples who I've picked out. And there are far more than this just in the comics, the yes, comics, just in the superhero comics. But these are the ones that I've picked out, some of them more obvious than others. But we're going to start off, of course, with Patsy Walker and Damon Hellstrom, then going into Deathstroke and Tara, Carol Danvers and Marcus, Ray Palmer and Jean Loring. Of course, we have to talk a bit about the Harley Quinn and Joker (laughs) romance. Uh, Purple Man and Jessica Jones. Hank Pym and Janet Van Dyne. Uh, Scott Summers and Madeline Pryor. Betty Ross and Bruce Banner. A little bit on Batman and Talia al Ghul. Doctor Doom and Victorious is a much more recent one. Scott Summers and Emma Frost, Clint Barton and fill in the blank. You can take your pick there. I have a couple. (laughs) I have a list. (laughs) Green Arrow and Black Canary. Uh, Very briefly, The Comedian and Silk Spectre. Stephen Strange and Clea. Reed Richards and Sue Storm. Uh, I will be explaining those if you are confused. Aurora Monroe and T'Challa. Starfire and pretty much anybody, and then uh, Kitty Pride and Colossus. Of course, you may have guessed as we get towards the end there, it's a lot more of my opinion that these relationships, especially when you get into, um, I would even say Reed and Sue is a really good example, but uh, yeah, no, they're all toxic, let's be real. <laughs> um, just pointing out things maybe people haven't thought about from perspectives they hadn't looked at. Um, those perspectives being a modern intersectional feminist perspective. I also have um, 
two names at the end of two superheroes I would not recommend dating. And while I'm going over this, I may think of more, but there's two at least that we would not recommend. Zero out of ten. Having gotten all of that important stuff out of the way, let's go over my usual social media stuff. Um, you can find me on Instagram. My username is Anna with the comics because my name is Anna and as you will see, I do have the comics. Uh, my Twitter account, I have been trying to use a little bit more as um, updates for the podcast. Uh, Twitter account is Savage She Geek because sensational is too many letters. I do have a website um, which holds all of the writing that I did before I started the podcast, um, as well as podcast notes and some other things. Uh, the website is sensationalshegeek.weebly.com. Uh, I do have some highlights there on the front page about some characters who are going to be very relevant in the comics soon, as well as the MCU, if we're being real. Uh, those characters are, uh, for the comics, Madeline Pryor, aka the Goblin Queen, uh, Ileana Rasputin, aka Magic, and then Clea, who is the new Sorcerer Supreme, just beginning this month in the uh, series Strange Number One. Let's be real; they should have called it Supreme. Um, but those I have I have a lot of in depth exploration of those characters on the front page of my site. If you are interested or curious about them at all, uh, I also have the pod notes for reading the podcast. If you are interested in that instead of listening, also of course for anyone who is hearing impaired who would like to keep up with the podcast goings on. Um, and you can also find links to everywhere that you can listen to the podcast on my site, which is most podcast hosting apps. And that does also include YouTube, where I post all of the videos in the, the podcast as videos in a uh, playlist so they're easy to find and they are in order and I also post some action figure review videos um, my most upload <clears throat> excuse me uh, my most recent upload was uh, a couple of weeks ago now it was the unboxing of the Hasbro Marvel Legends binary figure yes I do tear it apart a little bit um, but oh gosh I guess that was a few months that was January it's March now <laughs> I posted that in January <laughs> Um, but that one, I, I do also give some context on the history of the character and some fun stuff like that. But that one was, uh, it's a Walgreens exclusive here in the U.S. I have no idea if she's popping up in stores yet. Um, but if you haven't seen her and want to see what she's like, or have seen her and are curious if you should bother getting her, um, my husband ordered me this one early from the U.K. because it's not an exclusive there. It's the same figure, same everything. It's just without the, the Walgreens exclusive sticker on the box is literally the only difference. Um, so if you're curious at all about that, I do have that up on my YouTube channel, uh, which is again, just sensational she geek. Um, and hopefully, oh gosh, I've been trying to get this done for a while, but uh, I want to do an updated, um, uh, collection tour, uh, of various collection things between comics and action figures, uh, probably two different videos for those, but I would like to get those posted in the next few days, hopefully. So keep an eye up on the... Uh, YouTube channel for that as well. I do have a podcast Patreon, again, Sensational She Geek. It's set up for donations to support the podcast. Um, nothing is ever required or expected. Uh, I don't honestly even check who goes in every month. Uh, it's just there for anybody who would like to do that um, and, put, and it goes into a fund for the podcast to keep the podcast up and running because it does cost money. I do have a day job that I have to do. Um, you know, to make money for life uh, and the podcast that is what is set up to help make it so that I can work, spend more time working on the podcast instead of working at the day job. I also have a Kofi cash app, Venmo and PayPal, which are all linked on my link tree, which will appear linked at the bottom of every episode, uh, their episodes description. Last, if you at all are interested in, um, nerd themed stickers. Specifically, I have one that uh, says a woman's place is in the comic shop um, and a couple of other fun ones. They are, you can find those on Redbubble under Sensational She Geek. Oh no, sorry, under She Geek Shop because again, too many letters. <laughs> All right, let's get this going. Patsy Walker first appeared in Miss America Magazine number two in 1944. 
She was, for many years, the star of a series of romance comics, which at the time were extremely popular. Um, for example, now you may find something somewhat similar in Tom King's new indie series, Love Everlasting, which is an homage to stories of that era. It wasn't until 1965 that Patsy and her high school friend and rival, honestly, Hetty, made their first cameo appearance in the main Marvel Universe, featured in Fantastic Four Annual Number 3, The Wedding of Sue Storm and Reed Richards, who we will later discuss. In the superhero comic universe, the mainstream Marvel Universe, it was established that Patsy was the somewhat star or inspiration of a series of fictional works that were published by her mother, Dorothy Walker, and it was all based on Patsy's life and friends, making her somewhat of a child star in a sense. Patsy putzed around the Marvel Universe for a while before kind of dropping out of significance for a bit and then popped back into the Avengers run in the beginning of well, it was one, number 140, the beginning of the 140s. And then in 144, she finds the former suit of the cat, who is now Tigra, Greer Grant Nelson, or Greer Grant, depending on which name you prefer her to have, which era you're looking at. Um, and she takes the suit of the cat, she puts it on, and she calls herself Hellcat, becoming a new superhero of her own. Partially due to her past as a romance comic star of sorts, uh, she kind of becomes known as the happy-go-lucky Hellcat. It's a kind of sort of tagline that she swings around now and again. Uh, she's got cheesy lines, you know, and she's a bit of a tag-along feature for a while until she officially joins the Defenders in issue 44 of that series. It is on the Defenders where she first encounters Damon Hellstrom, an ally of the team with a sick, dark history of a sort. Their relationship starts off pretty rocky to begin with, with Patsy being possessed by a demon and Damon having to learn all his own truths about his uh, father and his true self to save her and save himself. But they end up sticking together, eventually marrying and starting a supernatural private detective business together. Their marriage was in The Defenders number 125. But marrying Damon and starting their business forced Patsy to withdraw from the rest of her life, from her friends, her teammates, the social circle that helped her thrive through all the crazy battles and darkness overhead. When Damon began having struggles with his own satanic identity again, Patsy makes a great sacrifice to try and save him, but she sort of gets taken advantage of uh, and Damon takes back his demonic form in a sense. I'm I'm summarizing things very well, very poorly here. Um, and in seeing this, with everything else, it causes Patsy's mind to break. She witnesses this whole thing happen, um, and it snaps her. It snaps her sanity, leaving her a drooling near vegetable in her bed, shut away from light, family, friends, and anything else she ever loved. She was taken care of, more or less, by Gargoyle, who was himself feeling very guilty about this. Um, and even Damon stopped visiting her and took other lovers because, of course, he's a great husband. This all takes place in the series Hellstrom, Prince of Lies, which is written by somebody who several two-ish years ago it came out was a misogynistic mental manipulator of women for decades. <laughs> So these events occurring in comics, he writes, really are not too surprising. <laughs> in issue 14 of Prince of Lies, Patsy is approached by a villain of her husband's death urge, and he talks her into committing suicide. And that is the death of Patsy Walker. Patsy does get rescued from hell, although it is on accident. It takes place during Thunderbolt's annual 2000, where Hawkeye is tricked into saving Patsy from hell. He thinks that it's his wife, Mockingbird, um, but it's not. It's just Patsy. Uh, kind of makes it a bit sour, but Patsy's back to life. She's got some new powers. She's got a cool new suit. Uh, and she has her own series called Hellcat, which is a th uh, three-issue series that took place in the year 2000, just after her resurrection. 
In the time since then, 22 years that it's been, Patsy has had a couple of her own series, which has been nice. Um, very lighthearted. A lot of a lot of the time, honestly, it feel it felt like writers were trying to ignore what Patsy went through. Um until recently. <laughs> and we have Christopher Cantwell now, who is writing the current Iron Man series. Um, not sure about the Patsy Tony romance. I don't like Tony Stark. <laughs> but um, there was an issue. The issue is Iron Man number three um, from Christopher Cantwell. And if you would like to read a very well written summary about this, uh, you can go to Screen Rant and there is an article by James Heinrich, possibly Henri. I have no idea how to spell how to say his last name. I'm sorry. But the article is called Marvel is Finally Taking an Avengers Suicide Seriously. It is a very, very well written article that talks about this very, very well written issue coming from Christopher Cantwell. Iron Man number three. I very much recommend it. Um, and it discusses, it has Patsy going, addressing finally <laughs> um, that phase of her life. Um, because she's kind of in a thing with Tony and of course romance and the past romance being horrible. Um, but in any case it is addressed and, um, she's still in the series and she's moving forward and he's writing her very well. Um, and she has not gone back with Damon for a moment, uh, because that shit was not it. <laughs> I have an everlasting love for Patsy Walker. Um, for for several reasons, her mental health struggles being one of them, maybe surprisingly, I don't know. But I feel like it's worth noting also while we're talking about her that she might be popping up in the She-Hulk show, the you know, you know the Disney Plus one that's going to come out later this year. My guess is over the summer. Um, there's been some rumors about this particular actress, and they haven't announced who she's going to be yet. Uh, but she describes, she herself describes her character as someone who was, um, was something like hanging out with She-Hulk and Jen. I don't remember what it was, but it was something that led me to think maybe it's Patsy because Patsy and Jennifer Walters have a very tight friendship. Um, they have been friends for a good while and have been intertwined in each other's history for even longer. So, um my everlasting love for Patsy was the inspiration for the start of this episode. Um, but now we can get into the rest of these relationships. Um, and of course with X one is what we're going to go into is Deathstroke and Tara easily one of the more controversial couples or pairings on this list. Uh, in short, what you can expect from their story is middle-aged Slate Wilson tricking love-struck 14-year-old Tara into betraying the Teen Titans and using sex to manipulate her. In short. In very short. The original Judas Contract storyline by Marv Wolfman and George Perez in 1980 to 1981 had Deathstroke using the teenager Tara to pose as a new team member of the Titans to gain the trust of each member until they eventually reveal their secret identities for her then to report back to Slade. The story implied a romantic or sexual relationship between the late to middle aged Deathstroke and the 15 year old Tara. They were shown in bed together, and over the years, flashbacks have only done more to confirm that gross suspicion. Now, I do have um, a very somewhat long quote here from Oscar winner and 12 Years a Slade screenwriter John Ridley uh, from the issue of Other History of the DC Universe that he wrote, which is a fantastic series, my word. Um, the other history of the DC universe is characters of color um, telling their story through the decades um, from their perspective, which for the most part is not ever how what we got in our own comics. So uh, he has a, a very interesting um, bit here about Deathstroke, uh, which is actually taken from the issue that focused on Katana. Uh, so I will go ahead and read the blurb here. 
Brion Markov, the crown prince of Markovia, who battled alongside us under the code name Geoforce, had a half sister, Terra. Like Brion, Terra had been given elemental abilities, and like Brion, Terra had became a hero who fought with the Teen Titans under the code name Terra. History would record Terra as a traitor who sided with Slade Wilson, Deathstroke, in plotting the Titans' demise. Terra was, quote, crazy, the meme went. Terra was, quote, psychotic. And when Terra died by her own hands, Terra, quote, got what she deserved. History has a convenient way of blaming the victim. Slade Wilson raped Terra Markov, not with physical force. He coerced an underage, mentally unstable girl into having sexual relations with him, again and again and again. Slade used that sexual dominance to manipulate Terra. Basically, Terra was trafficked. Slade was a known villain, but there was a legion of, quote, respectable men, giants of business and politics and media, who were with horrific regularity using their positions of influence to drag women into the shadows of society and do to them what Slade had done to Terra. For many years, Brion would have to deal with his, sis- with his half-sister being remembered as a duplicitous, duplicitous sociopath. That was made all the more painful as, je- as a deathstroke developed a cult following for being a, quote, badass and a man's man, but rarely was he called out for being what he was, a pedophiliac rapist. Tara deserved more than what she got, and she deserved to be remembered as being better than the nature to which she succumbed. But history is written by the living, not the dead. That was written by John Ridley uh, for the other history of the DC Universe, coming from the voice of Katana. Um, I did also find in researching this controversy. Um, Christopher Priest did write Deathstroke for a good while. Um, he is a very well-known um, writer. He did he pretty much put Black Panther on the map. Um, he has a different perspective. Now, remember, this is coming from a writer who was a reader at the time of the uh, Judas Contract story coming out. And this is simply his opinion. He did not end up writing about Terra, but this is simply his opinion about the situation. Deathstroke manipulating a young girl is reprehensible. It is kind of is it is kind of survivable in terms of character. You can't really soft pedal the behavior and continue to root for Deathstroke. Any attempt to rationalize the behavior just blows up in your face. Deathstroke's choices are indefensible. Excusing Deathstroke's behavior is wrong and stupid. Not talking about it leaves this cloud lingering over DC, over Deathstroke, over Marv, over me. Slade couldn't stand Terra. He was only using her to bring him to help him kill the Titans, which does not excuse his heinous behavior, nor does it, I suppose, fully exempt him from the label being pedophile and at the end of the interview uh he brings in an additional point now i have to point out again um his perspective as a reader was that and he writes this in the interview uh his perspective as a reader was that tara was a 20 or more year old woman who was posing as a teenager when he read that story so um that not having been the case it does kind of tweak um Again, remember, these are all opinions. So this next point, um, it's kind of a good point, but, you know, take with it what you may. He says, Labeling him a pedophile diminishes a very serious global threat to children by applying the term generically and often disparagingly as a dismissive aspiration, aspersion, excuse me, rather than treat the term and condition with the gravity with which it must be considered. Again, I don't think that he is clashing in any way. This interview was some time ago, but um, I don't think he and John Ridley would clash in their opinions in any way um, because the what, what John Ridley writes is that he was a pedophiliac rapist. Um, and yes, Tara did deserve more. Uh, Christopher Priest also writes a bit about how Tara was no saint either. Honestly, I feel like that is him doing a little bit of the victim blaming stuff, even though... Um, you know, he's a great writer and stuff. People can be still wrong about things. Um, and you are free, feel free to go out and hunt down that interview yourself and read the rest of it for more context, if you wish. That leads me into one of the easily more, 
uh, most problematic of these in the list, Carol Danvers and Marcus. Uh, if you are not familiar, Carol Danvers being Ms. Marvel, um, now Captain Marvel, she was on the Avengers as Ms. Marvel during this era, which was, it took place during Avengers 197 to Avengers 200. It was 1980, and I think this is probably one of the single most toxic stories in the history of cape comics. <laughs> Um, in short, <laughs> Carol is raped by her son, gives birth to him, then goes off with him honeymoon style while the Avengers wave her out gleefully. <laughs> Let's get to it here. Uh, the controversy of this issue obviously arises when this character, Marcus, reveals that he is the son of Immortus, who was an ally of the Avengers. Uh, he was raised in a limbo dimension, always wanting to be reborn into a life on Earth. He needed an extraordinarily strong woman to do that, so he picked out Ms. Marvel, and after <laughs> feeble and unsuccessful attempts at seduction, he rapes her, impregnating himself with her. Sorry, the other way around. Impregnating her with himself and becoming his own father. Excuse me for being a bit out there. This is, this is, this is an out there story, what can I say? Um, when Carol gives birth, and it gets bigger, when Carol gets birth three days later at full term, Marcus is born a baby, but he grows rapidly until he is fully grown into a, sh a fully grown man just a short while later. To make matters worse, after he admits this whole thing to the Avengers, Carol decides to leave Earth to have a relationship with him back in this limbo place, very much to the surprise, but notably not to the objection of her Avengers teammates. <laughs> that, I, I kid you not, that is the thing that happened. It was 1980 and they wrote it. They did. They... <sighs> I mean, the only things that I've ever seen from the writers about this was that they didn't know what they were doing. They were just, like, putting stuff together and throwing pieces together, and then in the end it turned out like that, and they were like, well, oh well. That's that's more or less what I heard. If you have heard other things from the writers, I would be curious to know what that would be. Um, and obviously, you know, people always try to cover their butts if they write something horrific in one year, and then some people call them out for them the next. Of course, they're going to try and cover their butts. But um, who is to say which is true there, <laughs> if that's a thing? Um, but I did find this essay from back in the day when these things first came out by a woman named Carol Strickland. And it is noteworthy, very noteworthy here, that I do not agree entirely with her essay um, because she does seem to be very anti-female sexuality, um, which is something that men do get away with constantly. So why can't women? So I have two quotes here from her, from two different parts of her essay. Um, so here's the first. She says, I didn't get it. Here, Miss Marvel had been kidnapped, held for, quote, weeks, according to the narrative provided by Marcus himself, and had not been won over, even though Marcus had done the ABC of stereotypical male mindset romance, given her nice clothes, serenaded her with history's best musicians. Why, I bet he even gave her candy and flowers. At no time is love or respect, not even like, mentioned. But apparently she hadn't been won over because he says, with a boost from Immortus's machines by which she means mind machines that he had access to, Ms. Marvel finally became his, and we may think of this being the truly possessive use of the word, at which point he impregnated her using non-technical term techniques without her knowledge of what he was truly doing. I think she's, Carol, there, that's the end of the quote, I think she says that very clearly the, um, the problem with this story here. Uh, her second quote here um, goes more directly to the creators. She says, In that issue, an all-male Marvel staff, presided by Jim Shooter and watched by the Comics Code, slaughtered Marvel's symbol of modern women, Ms. Marvel. They presented her as a victim of rape who enjoyed the process and even wound up swooning over her rapist and joining him in her free will. Such a storyline might have fit into the 1950s, when people actually believed such a thing was possible. I mean, they thought that women invited and enjoyed rape back then. But to present such a storyline today shows a collection of medieval minds at work, 
or at vicious play for such a storyline to pass through the echelons of editor, editor in chief, and comics code can only be a crime. She does not hold her punches there. Um, says some harsh stuff, yes, but she has a point. Again, I do not agree. You can find her her essay online, Carol A. Strickland. Um, I do not agree with her whole points, but um, these were some good ones. And she does have other good ones if you were interested in reading that as well. Chris Claremont, who many people rightfully do love, um, he does his best to fix this whole arc here in Avengers Annual number 10, which has Carol showing pain and righteous anger at her former teammates' behavior during that entire arc. Uh, this issue was also Carol's first appearance in comics at all uh, since Avengers 200 taking place a full year later. Um, I, I'm pulling up now the pages of that because I, it's, it's, it's worth, um, hearing what he has her say. Um, she's hanging out with Jessica Drew and the X-Men at Xavier's place. Um, oh, here, the, the Carol A. Strickland article is titled The Rape of Ms. Marvel. Um, if you were interested in finding that, I should have mentioned that before, but anyway, back to Avengers annual number 10. Um, it's the first appearance in comics since Avengers 200. Uh, and this is how she speaks to the Avengers. She's been heading out with X-Men and Spider-Woman. This is how she addresses her former teammates. Beast comes up to her and says, at first, no one says a word and Carol panics, regretting letting Jessica Drew go, Spider-Woman, wondering if the sudden burst of terror shows on her face. And then B says, hi, Carol, how are you doing? Better than expected, Hank. I'll never regain all of my memories. This is because she's at the X-Men place because Rogue attacked her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Spider-Woman saved her. So there you go. Um, but Professor Xavier has helped me remember who I am, who and what I was. I remember my family. I remember the Avengers and how I came to leave them. Bits and pieces, mostly. I've got a ways to go yet. Now, remember, this is... Um, during the era post rogue attacking her where she pretty much was a disconnected she she was a person disconnected to her identity um she had no emotional connection to her past or anything like that um s except for uh this one thing that she that kind of triggered the entire thing with rogue and everything uh the incident with marcus so um she says, uh, let's see, Hawkeye says, what happened to Marcus? After you left him, we didn't see you two lovebirds again. And Carol tells him, I'm sure you didn't, Hawkeye. Marcus is dead. Iron Man tells her, we're very sorry, Carol. You two made a wonderful couple. We hoped you'd be happy together. Is there anything we can do to help ease your pain? And she throws down the lemonade, you know, tray she's holding. Didn't you do enough to cause it? And uh, she says, I didn't love Marcus. I never loved Marcus. Don't any of you realize what happened months ago, what Marcus did to me? I left because I had no choice. Marcus gave me none. He was a sad, pathetic creature, possessing the abilities of a god, the body of a man, the emotional maturity of a child. In limbo, his every wish was granted. He saw me. He desired me. He used me as a means to escape from limbo to earth. And when that plan failed, he took me back with him. You saw it happen, Hacka. Happened, Hawkeye. You, Iron Man, and Thor. You heard his story. Marcus said that Immortus' devices could bend me to his will, but he didn't want me that way. He set out to win my love, and finally, as he told you, with a subtle boost from Immortus' machines, he succeeded. But for all his brilliance, Marcus was careless. He made a fa fatal error in his calculations. When I gave birth to him, his body shifted fractionally out of the sink, out of sync with the rhythm of life in limbo. Where before, time passed normally for him, it now passed at a fantastically accelerated rate. In days after our return, he aged years. By the time he realized what was happening, he was too old and senile to deal with it. Within a week, he was dust. Free of his mind control, I learned enough of Amortis' secrets to allow me to transport myself home. The rest you know. Wonder Boy, Wonder Man says, Carol, why didn't you return to the Avengers? Wanda asks, why didn't you at least contact us? She says, Wanda, I never wanted to see you, any of you, again. I hated you, because when I needed you most, you betrayed me. There I was, pregnant by an unknown source, running through a nine-month term literally overnight. 
confused, terrified, shaken to the core of my being as a hero, a person, a woman. I turned to you for help, and I got jokes. The wasp thought it was great, and the beast offered to play teddy bear. Your concerns were for the baby, not for how it came to be, nor the cost for me to me of that conception. You said everything Marcus said at face value. You didn't question, you didn't doubt. You, simple let, you simply let me go with a smile and a wave and a bouncy bomb voyage. That was your mistake, for which I paid the price. My mistake was trusting you. After a trauma like mine, it's easy to wallow in bitterness and self-pity, but both grief and guilt have to be faced, dealt with, exercised. There's more. There has to be more to being heroes than simply defeating villains. You have a role, a purpose, far greater than yourselves. You have to set examples, lead the way. You represent what should be, what we dream of becoming, not what we are. You screwed up, Avengers. That's human. What is also human is the ability to learn from those mistakes, to grow, to mature. If you do that, even a little, then perhaps what I went through will have a positive meaning. It's your choice. Beast asks her, Carol, what about you? What will you do? She says, pick up the pieces of my life, start again, survive. I'm good at that. Wanda apologizes. She says, I know, Wanda. Don't worry. I'll be all right. And of course, then she spends a great long while with the uncanny X-Men until the brood capture them. She becomes binary and she finally at last gets to actually start her life over the way that she kind of wanted to. And then after years and years, they decide to give her an alcohol problem for some reason. Um, and then after that, she gets back to being Miss Marvel big time. And then Carol becomes Captain Marvel. <sighs> Comics. Uh, moving on to our next couple, <laughs> Ray Palmer and Jean Loring. This is a DC Comics couple. In short, your in short is, Jean is written as a mentally fragile wannabe career woman, is somewhat majorly gaslighted after learning Ray is the Atom, and becomes a sad moment in DC Comics history. <laughs> to expand on that a little bit, um, after a very tumultuous relationship and working partnership, Ray Palmer and Jean Loring finally get engaged. Ray spends a ridiculous amount of time trying to decide, like, it is, it is insane the amount of time that he spent moping around trying to figure out if he should tell Jean that he's the Adam. She's his fiance. He, obviously the answer is yes. And as their weddings get clo gets closer, he debates it time and time again, more and more, to himself, to his friends, to his fellow heroes, to everybody but Jean. In his mind, Jean's somewhat fragile at times. Mental health has always been a bit tricky, with her having had multiple breakdowns before their marriage. So he's concerned the truth will cause her into another pit cause her to fall into another pit of despair. But is that really fair for him to make that choice for her? Isn't keeping that secret for so long and then her finding out on accident later on even worse? So he finally does tell her the day before their wedding, she's obviously hurt that he's kept the secret for so long. They had spent many a comic panel talking about how Jean has absolutely no secrets from him and he never could. Uh, she never could. Um... And so obviously this is a huge slap to the face. She has nothing to say in response to him for a while. They literally have blank comic panels there where she just stares at him. And then she needs, she says she needs to think if the wedding is even going to happen. So they decide to go on and marry, but they divorce three years later. Two years after that, Jean ends up being possessed by a character called Eclipso, suffers another mental breakdown, and then kills Sue Dinby and Jack Drake in an effort to rekindle her romance with Ray. Good stuff. Um, this one I am personally not as familiar with, um, but I did find a fantastic uh, blurb about it, about Jean, um, from the DC Continuity Project, which is not a thing I was familiar with until I was doing this research. And here is what they have to say. She was, from the very beginning, depicted as a career woman, but it was always understood that the eventual plan was to give up her career and settle down and get married after she had, quote, proven she had to make it as a lawyer. She Proven she can make it as a lawyer, unquote. This led to Ray Palmer helping with her cases as the Adam, but only so that she would hurry up and decide to marry him. 
Meanwhile, even though she was clearly meant to be a modern, self-sufficient woman, that often seemed to mean writing her as a standoffish and unpleasant. None of this was particularly wrong, other than the fact that Jean was never really permitted to be an actual person as much as she was a puzzle for Ray to solve. The end result was an attempt to write a modern career woman that unfortunately played right into the expect- uh, right into the expectations that her career was doomed to never amount to more than a hobby. It was a very complex idea built just to keep her in place. It's not surprising that she was never written as much of an interesting character, and the decades passed. And as the decades passed, their marriage devolved into a narrative complication. Ray's stories were best when he was lost in the depths of Subworld, and Jean had no place in those stories. So ultimately, Jean wasn't an important enough wasn't important enough for this sort of character assassination to have ever mattered that much, but what really made this unfortunate is that the lousy understanding of the original writers, the men that wrote a competent career woman as a silly, obsessed girl, left a character that should have been so interesting as an utter vacuum of personality for a writer to later turn into a serial killer in a story that will ultimately be remembered as a low point in DC's mis institutionalized misogyny." End quote. Um, that, that I feel like that was a pretty good summation of <laughs> the tragedy of Jean Loring. Of course, I do have to add the Joker and Harley Quinn in here. Um, I feel like this doesn't need too much discussing in the year 2022, um, but uh, we'll do it still. In short, here's your in short. She becomes obsessed with him and he uses that to his advantage, using her as a sidekick and punching bag equally. <laughs> Um, it is worth noting, it is incredibly worth noting, that Paul Dini and Bruce Timm created Harley Quinn for Mad Love, which they themselves called a cautionary tale. Um, her being romantic with the Joker was never supposed to be, like, something people strive to, uh, parallel. No, 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 this was always supposed to be a cautionary tale, although I also read that it's ba like loosely based off of a relationship of a friend of theirs. So I really wonder who is that somebody we know? Was that somebody we know? Was that somebody in the industry? Probably not. It's probably just some random person. Um, and that's really sad anyway, that that's a thing, th this kind of relationship. But um, I don't have any quotes for this one. Just the bit that Paul Dini and Bruce Tim did create this as a cautionary tale, their relationship. So please don't try to mimic it. <laughs> Uh, their, their relationship has been portrayed across a variety of media formats and canon and non-canon official DC works, including TV, movies, comic books, and a lot more. In that time, Harley Quinn has been portrayed as everything from a money-hungry swindler to a bimbo, a secret genius to a desperate young woman. In this... In this story, she wants to profit off her work at Arkham with the Joker. In this version, she got her degree by sleeping with her professors. In this one, she earned her diploma the usual way with top marks. Here she's fascinated by him, here terrified, and here turned on. The only thing that never changes in the Joker and Harley stories is him. He's always violent and brutal, a lover of crime and chaos. He always hurts her, physically and emotionally. And after their time together, when Harley goes on to find love and relationships after the Joker, he does not. It could be said that Harley Quinn is the more important character of the two. Of the two of them, she's the only one who's developed her character beyond what we see her as for the first time. She's worked on herself, done good and bad, tried things and failed. Battles have been lost and won. But the Joker has only ever just been the Joker. So in my mind, Harley Quinn, you know, there's a reason <laughs> DC Comics calls her the fourth pillar of their trinity. Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman, and Harley Quinn, not the Joker. Next up, Purple Man and Jessica Jones back over at Marvel. In short, he controls her against her will. That's about the short of it. Um, while on a mission as a Croatian spy, Kilgrave was doused by chemicals that turned his skin purple and granted him the ability to psychically control others. The 2001 to 2004 Alias series by Brian Michael Bendis and Michael Gatos um, really, really explored the Purple Man in relation to Jessica Jones. 
um, and explained that she was the superhero Jewel, uh, but Kid- Kilgrave had kidnapped her and brainwashed her into being his girlfriend and accomplice in crime. He tried to use her to kill Daredevil, but she failed in that mission, and the X-Men's Jean Grey was able to free her from his mind control, but the experience left Jessica with severe PTSD, and she quit being a superhero to work as a private investigator at her own alias Investigations. Oddly, when they go back into Ryan and Jessica Jones series a few years ago after the Netflix show made it big, um, they have Purple Man apologize for all that, which I don't think really made a difference. Um, but that's, you know, good for him, I guess. <laughs> to spend years within a relationship with a woman who does not want to, but you're forcing her to under mind control, but you know doesn't really make up for all that touching her under mind control without consent just saying it's a bit more complicated than that and now the dreaded hank pym and janet van dyne there is some serious hank pym like i guess stands out there i don't really get it um but i guess respect um for sticking with it i don't know in short, in short, Hank Pym gets a chemical on him. <laughs> That's very in short. And becomes Yellow Jacket, messes up some stuff with the Avengers, tries to cover it up, and ends up revealing himself as a perpetrator, and then hits his wife. The end. <laughs> this is a weird one, guys. This is a weird one. Um, and it has been tried to be written over the years, various times. I think everybody knows that Hank Pym hit his wife in a comic panel one time. Um, whether or not that was actually the intention... We'll, we'll never know. Uh, Jim Shooter, who did write the script for the issue, says no. He did not mean for that to be what happened. That was a comic artist who, um, it just got the it was Bob Paul was the illustrator. He he had um made a very a gesture that looked. I like at what I don't I don't like they just want to say oh yeah they the just the drawing got away from us, um. I don't know. He's he's trying to he's trying to blame it on John Bushima or something. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but okay. So already you see this is like a really odd one. Um So let's see. We're <laughs> so in let's see. We get he starts we started off so he's he's um Ant-Man, right? So then he gets this chemical spill on him and it causes him to adopt a reckless behavior identity that he then takes up as yellow jacket so then as yellow jacket he um attacks a villain of the avengers during a fight after she had already surrendered and the avengers are like super offended by that so they consider taking his avengers membership um so instead of cooperating with the hearing um hank gets into a a uh, manic state and builds this robot to have attack the Avengers because then he can come and save them and they'll be like, okay, Hank, you're good. Um, but yeah, then that doesn't end up working out and three days later, Hank smacks Janet in the face when she tries to reason with him. So... <laughs> um, and then, of course, people, you know, try to say all oh, character assassination. It's not... I don't... I don't really think it's character assassination. I don't think you can really say that about anything. It's fictional. It's fictional. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jim Shooter, uh, this bit that he has, it claims he never wanted Hank to hit her. And it was this was from a personal blog article published in 2011. He, uh, the quote says, in that story, there's a scene where Hank is supposed to have accidentally struck Jean while throwing his hands up in despair and frustration, making a sort of get away from me gesture while not looking at her. Bob Hall had been taught by John Bushima to go for the most extreme action. Oh, there we go. And that turned into a right cross, which doesn't really make sense, but whatever. He said there was no time to have it redrawn, which in the day which to this day has caused this tragic story of Hank Pym to be known as the wife beater. <laughs> Jim Shooter, get off the high horse. It's, it's too late. <laughs> you did what you did. <laughs> um, Hank Pym now, of course, he built Ultron at one point, and now he is Pymtron. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. What can I say? 
Um, please don't hate on me for talking about it. I know it's a, people have their very intense opinions about Hank, Hank Pym in the comics, so... I'm just stating what I see on the internet in history. <laughs> Let's get into something I'm way more confident at. Scott Summers and Madeline Pryor. Now, I would like to note as I start this, I did not do an ounce of research for this. I mean, all the... Re I, this is all straight from my brain. I knew this stuff already. There's a better way to phrase what I just said, I swear. <laughs> I didn't have to reference anything because I already knew all this. There you go. <laughs> in short, in short, uh, shortly after the death of Jean Grey, Scott meets a woman who looks exactly like her. Mad this is not a short in short. Madeline Pryor. <laughs> he becomes infatuated with her and marries her, even though he himself isn't sure if he loves her for her appearance of Jean. Not long after their wedding, when Maddie's about to give birth, he discovers- well, actually, that's not- when Maddie has his baby, she gives birth by herself, uh, and discovers- he discovers the real Jean is alive and abandons his newborn wife and child. That's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get into it a bit more, you know, he initiates the relationship because he misses Jean and she looks like Jean. He marries her because he wants to have married Jean. He has a kid with her because that's what he wanted with Jean. But on what should have been a joyous occasion, the child's birth, Scott is only sad, a big lump on a log among everybody else's happiness. When Maddie is almost ready to give birth, he goes off with the X-Men on a mission, and after they return, he remains away from her for two whole weeks, not even calling to check in on her or let her know if he's okay. So when she goes into labor, she is at home alone, and she gives birth to Nathan Summers on the floor of their kitchen. She calls a cab herself and takes him to the hospital to get them checked up. When she returns home, the X-Men come, and Scott is there. Everyone is absolutely thrilled to see that she's okay, and the baby too, especially Rachel, who is the team's phoenix now, being the daughter of Scott and Jean from another dimension, and now Nathan is her new baby brother. But the father of the baby, Scott, stays at the edges of the room, facing away, not joining in on the celebration. So it makes sense that not long after, when he learns that Jean is alive again, he leaves in an instant, doesn't say goodbye to his wife or explain what's going on. Around the same time, Maddie and the baby Nathan are attacked in the hospital, where Maddie is left with no identity, no proof of her or Nathan's existence. This is because of Sinister, who created a clone of who created her as a clone of Jean. Now that Jean has returned, he needed to cover his tracks and sent the Marauders to kill her and bring him the baby, which was his ultimate desire in this entire quest. But they bring up, but they mess up and the X-Men stop, uh, the X-Men stop them from hurting Maddie, though they do get Nathan. Luckily for her, the Uncanny X-Men are more than willing to take her in under their wing and she plays a key role on the team as their tech person. Time goes on until at last Maddie sees the original X-Men on TV with Scott and Jean together. It's the team Scott left her to go back and join. The realization that he abandoned her and her child, their child, for Jean Grey, leaves Maddie unconscious, unprotected from demonic forces from entering her mind, and tricking her into embracing the most evil parts of her inner soul and becoming the Goblin Queen. In the modern era, when it becomes clear that mutants who who were ever connected to Cerebro can be resurrected on Krakoa by the five. Alex Summers, the only Summers who truly did love Maddie, ple pleads her case to his brother, who sits on the quiet council at that time. Scott denies his request, request fl flat out, and later on he denies him again, arguing that Madeline wasn't a real being because she was a clone. Not only is that hypocritical, that is a big slap in the face to her, the woman who bore his son. And at long last, Madeline has finally returned to life and to Alex. All it took was the five learning that the Quiet Council were denying clones rebirth to make an announcement that clones are their own people, and Cerebro does recognize them as separate beings, so they are own, their own individuals. And we are going to be seeing Madeline Pryor in New Mutants 25 starting in April. I'm going to be doing a, um, the next Yancey Street special coming out in April is going to be about Ileana Rasputin and Madeline Pryor. Next on the slaughter is Betty Ross and Bruce Banner. In short, they marry and she spends years being abused and manipulated by him to the point that she gains her own whole persona, Red Harpy. 
Immortal Hulk's the Immortal Hulk series by Al Ewing did a lot of work for showing that um, just by associating with Bruce, Betty has suffered tremendously. Betty's Bruce fling with superpowers is when was in 1973 when, due to being Bruce's wife, the villain Modok transformed her into a flying green Hulk monster called the Harpy. The process destroyed Betty's sanity and led her to attack the Hulk, but Bruce was able to restore both her mind and her human form. Bruce and Betty's wedding in 1986 is the Incredible Hulk 313 by John Byrne was another happy moment filled with chaos and disaster. Bruce was only able to marry Betty because he was separated from the Hulk, who was a mindless who was on a mindless rampage at the time. Betty's father, General Ross, showed up at the wedding and shot Bruce's best friend, Rick Jones. Banner and the Hulk had to merge back together since neither one could live without the other. Her marriage to the Hulk led to several catastrophes, including Betty's death in 1998's Incredible Hulk 466 by Adam and David Kubert. And then it took almost 40 years after Betty returns to gain powers again, shortly after becoming... Uh, shortly after her father became Red Hulk in 2008, he helped her turn into She-Hulk, Red She-Hulk, who had a brief superhero career before losing her powers again in 2014. And then in Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk series, Betty underwent her third transformation, the mashup of the previous two Red Harpy. This happens when a soldier shoots and kills Betty to get at Bruce, and the gamma radiation that's still in her body brings her back to life as Red Harpy. This incident, this incident alone demonstrates the unhealthy facet of Bruce and Betty's relationship, as mere proximity results in Betty's death and subsequent gamma transformation. Plus, these transformations were massive strains on Betty's relationship with Bruce, putting them at violent odds with one another. It's understandable that Betty resents Bruce for these incidents, especially since she notes that Bruce didn't, Bruce couldn't stand her, that couldn't stand her as Red Harpy. Bruce ain't shit. It does need to be mentioned that Bruce has inside of him multiple Hulk personas. It's got a lot. It's it's got a lot going on. A lot to get into. Um, but kind of think of him like Crazy Jane from Doom Patrol. They're all these separate entities that wait their turn to go up top and run things. One of them, Joe Fixit, has a tough relationship with Betty already after letting her believe that Bruce was dead in the 88 run of Hulk where Joe goes to be a bouncer in Vegas. No matter which persona maintains control, Bruce cannot maintain a healthy relationship with Betty, and yet to this day, she still periodically steps in to help Bruce or shake some sanity into him. The fact that Betty was willing to help her ex-husband against anyone in any way is a true testament that is a true testament to her dedication to helping Hulk overcome these schemes, and that she really is a better person than Bruce. Well, here's one that people will have definitely opinions on. Batman and Talia al Ghul. In short, her father wanted him to wanted Batman to be his heir, wanted to get an heir from Batman, basically. So she seduces him, drugs him, may or may not rape him and impregnate him with her with his son. It's it's um We'll, we'll, we'll explain in a minute why that may or may not be a legitimate storyline, even. So, Talia was raised by Ra's al Ghul, head of the demon, leader of the League of Shadows, so it makes sense why she would be so manipulative. Though her father was a leader, her status as a woman still made her an unsuitable heir in his eyes. So his ultimate goal for her was to find a suitable mate to give her a true-born male heir. His best choice, Batman, of course. The story was called Son of the Demon... And then she gives birth to Damian Wayne, who was created by Grant Morrison, and who was raised to take over the League of Assassins. That would be Damian and not Grant. Um, now, the reason that this does have so much controversy, aside from the whole idea of she may or may not have raped him, um, is the may or may not part. And this is why. So Grant Morrison uh, created Damian Wayne and was the one to establish that Bruce was specifically unconscious during Damien's conception. Um, you can look up the pages about that. But um, later on, this is what Grant had to say about it. 
For a long time, DC said Son of the Demon was out of continuity. Now it's just kind of out of continuity. I didn't read it before I started writing this. I messed up a lot of the details, like Batman wasn't drugged when he was having sex with Talia, and it didn't take place in the de in the desert. I was relying on shaking memories. But now we have this new Superboy punch continuity. People still don't realize how important that single punch was to cover everyone's ass. Which he's talking about, um infinite crisis there um so yes it is a bit shaky the person who wrote the like establishing thing that confirmed that she raped him isn't even sure if that was what he was supposed to write you would think editors would know how to do their jobs <laughs> have we gotten better i don't even know if we've gotten better with that Ugh. But that's that's the rundown, Batman and Talia. Um, and then now, you know, Batman does long term is with Catwoman. Um, and he does end up going to Talia at one point and she and not for for her permission for marrying Catwoman or anything, but uh, for something else about Catwoman's sister. Um, and uh, Catwoman and she end up battling it out and she actually beats her with a sword. So... And so Talia approves of Catwoman and Batman. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> because she's, like, the only legitimate female connection he has. Um, he doesn't have a mother. He doesn't have a Alfred, a female Alfred. Um, they're not really in a relationship, but she's his baby mama. So that's, that's the, I don't know, I just feel like she's the one other source. I don't know. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Now this one gets me riled up. Uh, Doctor Doom and Victorious. Um, I'll explain who Victorious is if you don't know what I'm talking about. But in short, Doom decides to wed his daughter figure because the fairy needs a queen for some reason all of a sudden, which it's never needed before, but okay. So when we fe first meet uh, Victorious, whose name is Zora, Zukovic, Zora Vukovic, she is introduced as an elite member of Doom's Latvarian Guard. In Christopher Cantwell's, I've already talked about his Iron Man, in his Doom series, though, before that, her character was greatly explored in relation to Doom's. Tara, Tara, Zora is tall, strong, and impressive. She is likely in her 20s and has intense dedication to Latveria and its ruler, Victor Von Doom. She works as his right hand, helps him, helps him rule, helps him run home when he is return home when he is lost oh my gosh and looks after latveria in his stead she is for all intensive purposes his adopted daughter bazor is the native of the neighboring enemy kingdom from which her birth mother now acts as a spy against latveria this woman, her birth mother, is captured and Doom commands Victorious to execute her, knowing their relation. She does, knowing their relation, with full knowledge of who this woman is. When she comes away with, from the experience, she vows to herself to always protect Latveria, even if that means protecting it from Doom himself. So you get a good image of her there, right? Very solid. Very sturdy. Unfortunately... Someone and Marvel let Dan Slott get his hands on her. And yes, I know he technically created her, but he had like very little to do with her character. Um, and he decided to make her marry her father figure <laughs> in a tragic arc on a tragic run of Fantastic Four. Slott writes that Doom suddenly feels that Latveria requires a queen. <laughs> something that he has never seemed to care about like this before so he chooses to marry his most dedicated subject the lady victorious his daughter figure uh, to make matters worse the playing out of those events are even far more atrocious than just the idea of them on the night of her wedding a some reason shy and sheepish zora invites the human torch into her bed who is in himself in a relationship with another woman. And the entire time she's like a sappy mess, worried about what Doom would think. What? On their wedding day, not only is Zora portrayed as a spineless bootlicker of Doom, she breaks down mid-ceremony to admit that she had sex with Johnny Storm. First of all, what the fuck? Second of all, why would Doom care? They're not actually in a sexual relationship or a romantic relationship. What? And Doom gets mad? Because now there's going to be... What? She... What? I just... 
I couldn't bring myself to finish the arc, so granted, you know, something could have different happened, but just what? He's basically marrying his daughter. <laughs> and they're just writing her poor, poorly. Oh my gosh. It makes me so sad to think about, so we're going to move on. I have a somewhat short bit here on Clinton Barton and take your pick. Uh, in short, he is the king of being bad at being monogamous. <laughs> Let's go through his relationships. With Mockingbird, he married her and cheated on her. With Wasp, they had a superficial uh, attraction-only relationship. With Spider-Woman, he cheated on her. With Black Widow, he's extremely codependent and most likely cheated on her. With Night Nurse, he neglects her and lies to her repeatedly. Oh, and in the Ultimate Comics, a different universe altogether, Laura Barton is his wife and she and their kids are killed. I should have just added him to the don't date this asshole section. <laughs> um, I am not a fan of Clint Barton. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> We're going to talk about Scott Summers and another woman, Emma Frost. So in short, they fall back on each other whenever their traditional fart partners. partners are unavailable, mostly using each other for sex and or power. Their relationship usually hurts someone, if not just each other. Makes sense there. Okay, so in 2004, ancient history now, Emma Frost, formerly a villain, now became the co-leader for a school of mutant children across from co-leader Scott Summers. Her character developed beautifully for a while, and she was a true leader. But as soon as she and Scott began their sexual relationship, everything about her character took the back burner, including being a teacher and a leader in favor with her sleeping with Cyclops. Even when she knows he would rather be with Jean, even when Jean returns and they continue their affair psychically, Emma Frost is not a character who would choose to be second choice. Anybody should know that who knows Emma Frost. There is even a line from Namor when she started up a relationship with him after leaving Cyclops. After, I don't know if he left her, she left him at that point. Honestly, who can tell? Namor has this good point. He does not deserve you. He treats you with disrespect. He married the redhead, didn't he? Actually, he married both the redheads. So, yeah. Even though one of them he wished was the other one. In 2011, I did find this article on Emma. It was written in 2011. I can't find it again now. I'm sorry. Um, but I have a quote from it. Um, it's, she's, they say, She used to be so poised, calculating, impenetrable, and now they have turned her into a mere shell of her former self, living out her existence in the shadow of Scott Summers. Oh, Emma, she could do so much better than him. I mean, she could be a queen again if she really wanted it. She could be with Namor. Um, yes, um, my whole thing here is that Emma being with Scott is just against her character entirely. She would never do that. She, she values herself too much. <laughs> and uh, also on Emma... Um, Claremont and Byrne, they did create her and successfully make her both sexy and powerful and fearsome, yes, but at what cost? I argue that she could have been developed just essentially, um, like, as a sensuality queen without needing to have the only women of the Hellfire Club wear actual bikini bottoms and corsets with nothing else. It's kind of ridiculous. And then all the men were in these old-fashioned, ugly-ass Victorian-style dressing gowns? Like, what kind of wacky power balance is that? The Emma we all know and love would expect the others to dress their part as well. The female gaze does not like what those Hellfire Club men were dressed in, so why would she dress for the male gaze? Because she loves it, but she's definitely not going to let them wear that ugly shit around her. That I, I still... What was with the Hellfire Club outfits? It's so stupid. Anyway, I love Emma and don't love Scott. Green Arrow and Black Canary, aka Oliver Queen and Dinah Lance. Two very old DC characters. I don't think they're legacy characters, really, though. I don't think there's ever been additional ones of them. Um, I could be wrong. But um, their, their whole thing, in short... They were, they've been off and on through the years, sleeping with other heroes between the breaks. She's always been treated as lesser than him, and he always treats her, not always, but he, he even treated her as lesser than him on many earlier occasions in their relationship. Very misogynistic writing. 
Um, and he does have a tendency to see male superiority and exclude women heroes, no matter how formidable they might be. Um, Oliver does cheat on her several times, um, and Dinah Lance ends up being merely a side character in Green Comics after long since earning her way. Um, as of more recent history, they haven't even really been in the comics. I guess Green Arrow has, but Black Canary hasn't, so yet again... Dinah Lance ends up being merely a side character in Green Arrow's comics after long since earning her way. Another problematic, I mean, they're all problematic, but another uh, touchy one is the comedian in Silk Spectre. Um, in short, they're teammates on The Watchmen and he tries to rape her. <laughs> they continue being teammates after that accident, incident, definitely not an accident, uh, and may or may not have had a sexual relationship anyway with Sally Jupiter being weirdly hot for uh, the comedian. <laughs> uh, depending on your portrayal. In the Watchmen TV show, however, the script does end up getting flipped as time goes by, with Sally Jupiter becoming a private eye and, according to the writers, becoming a more or less, or turning into more or less, her own version of the comedian. Karmic justice, maybe? I don't know. Pick your terms. These next two are going to be relatively the same, so we'll bunch them together. Um, Stephen Strange and Clea, as well as Reed Richards and Sue Storm. <laughs> um, two relationships where you get a very young woman who ends up being attached to a very old man. Super weird. Why didn't they notice that back in the day? It's super weird. In short, for Stephen and Clea, she spends decades proving herself to him just to have him let himself lose her and later wipe her mind in a deal with the devil that she had no choice in. Cool. Reed Richards and Sue Storm, in short, old man marries young woman. I feel like that's creepy enough as it is. Especially since he was like the first romance that she was in and she was so young. Um, yeah. Oh, going back to um, the, uh, the article by... In the Carolyn Marcus one. Carol Strickland, okay? So Carol Strickland also had some stuff to say about a few other characters. Um, uh, let's see, what'd she say? She says, The invisible girl whimpers and complains from the nearest corner while the menfolk do the fighting. Um, which is a sad but somewhat accurate depiction of what the comics at the time were like. How long did it take them to finally call her the Invisible Woman? Some people still call her the Invisible Girl. That shit drives me nuts. She's not a girl. She's a grown woman. She's got kids. Call her a woman. Other things that uh, this woman said, this um, Carol Strickland said, Black Canary is less than a shadow of her man, the ultra macho Green Arrow. The invisible girl whimpers and complains from the nearest corner while her menfolk do the fighting. The wasp dreams of new costumes and new hunks to pester. Supergirl cries over a broken date. See, she she had she was very upset with how women were being portrayed, um, and she has a point for the most part. But the the anti sexuality bit she did not have a point about. Um, but yes, uh, old man with young women, very creepy, very weird. And for Stephen and Clea, she's she's portrayed in the drawing as significantly younger than him. And they often choose to call her girl instead of any other term, literally any other term. So they make a point to draw Stephen with, you know, he's got the Clooney. I guess we can't really say that now. Hmm. It's, it's the Doctor Strange side, side silver, you know, whatever you call that. Um... So he's old enough to have that, but she is still being called a young girl. Same goes for Sue Storm. It's literally the same. Reed Richards, always been an old man. Why? <laughs> Marrying this young woman. I still think that Sue and Namor belong together. I'm not even joking. I would pay to read that. I think we all know the issue with Aurora Monroe and King T'Challa. It was a marriage of means. They were a power couple with intense passion. Love and hatred are both passionate. <laughs> they are together again now, which I don't really know how I missed that. Um, but they're living on separate planets, so I feel like it's probably going to go better than last time. Starfire and Arsenal. I'm going to run through these last few together. Starfire and Arsenal slash anyone... In short, Starfire was portrayed uh, is often portrayed as a sex-hungry alien seductress without much more beyond those characteristics, um, and there are several series to back that sentiment up, unfortunately. 
And finally, Putra Rasputin and Kate, or otherwise known as Kitty, Pride. In short, he bent to the crush of a little girl and dated his little sister's best friend. <laughs> I, I think people forget that Kitty was too young to be on the X-Men, um, and she wasn't on the New Mutants for whatever reason, because she wanted to be on the X-Men, I guess. But his sister was on the New Mutants, and they were more or less the same age, you know, after her whole limbo trip and back. Um, and so she and Ileana were like BFFs, and she's crushing real hard on her best friend's brother, and he's like a lot older um, and more experienced and more mature and stuff, and ends up being the only boyfriend that she has until she's like 30. It's not weird to you? Hmm. <laughs> and finally, um, the two characters who I would not recommend getting into a relationship with would be Johnny Storm and Tony Stark. Tony Stark because, of course, um, his addiction issues and his very bad reputation in other terms and his asinineness and, you know, most of just his personality in general. And Johnny Storm, because of his wild history of bad relationships and the fact that I, I firmly believe he is closeted gay. It's not a bad thing for him, but it's bad for any women who try to get with him because they're just going to not end up happy. <laughs> um, yeah, so final thoughts here. Um, why? What is my purpose here? Pointing out that comics are shitty sometimes towards women mostly. Um, and really bad about things like, you know, consent and mental health and, and love doesn't really hit the mark most of the time in comics. And we're not sure why, why do these creators want to keep portraying, you know, aside from one or two of these couples, all of these characters are supposed to be heroes. So how do they keep getting into these horribly toxic relationships with each other? It's, it's, it's an odd concept to this day with Dan Slott writing the creepy old man marrying the young daughter figure. Why do they keep putting these things in comics? I mean, this is a historical thing. I have no answer for that. Um, my suggestions would be some weird psychological crap like fantasies or thinking that it'll sell. I don't know. I don't know. But it's all just an exploration of toxic romance in comics. And I hope that you learned something. I hope I didn't make you too mad. <laughs> Um, and, well, and I hope that you enjoy the other episodes I'm putting up this week. Have a nice day.